Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Career Exploration Saturday. I'm your host, Ebony Tyler. I have real conversations with real people about real jobs. So this week, I'm so excited to have sister cousin Dina. Dina has brought us some fantastic guests. And now today, she's going to share with us about her non-traditional career journey. Now listen, Dina has been a part of the Liberated Success community from day one. And I'm so excited to have her here, okay? She is doing some amazing work. Her work is super impactful and it is changing the world. All right, let's jump right in. So welcome, welcome. Everyone, look, this is Sister sister Cousin Dina, okay? Welcome, Sister Cousin Dina, to Career Exploration Saturday. I'm so So happy to have you on, and you have brought us so many fabulous guests. So welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, as you can see, with all of the people that I'm sending, that um, I'm a big fan. So I'm happy to be here and to share my non-traditional career path and story. Non-traditional. You know what? Let me write that down, because we are going to get to that so you know you know how I like to start definitely tell us about 16 year old Dina did she have it all together did she know what she wanted to be definitely not uh 16 year old Dina I would say was confused looking for a place to belong you know I think probably like what the average 16 year old girl is going through you know struggling with body image issues um which path do I want to take do I want to go right do I want to go left do I want to be the good girl do I want to be the bad girl do I want to have a good relationship with my mother do I want to hate her for the rest of my life like all of those things were like the 16 year old Dina so um definitely confused at 16 I really um probably in my heart I wanted to be a nurse I believe I was at that point where I was like, oh, yeah, I want to be a nurse. I want to help people. I want to get in the medical field. People say they make money. I've seen black nurses before. I can probably do that. So I think at 16, I wanted to be a nurse. Okay. Okay. So I know that you're not a nurse. And um, our audience doesn't know that but you are so I feel like I want to fast forward and then we're going to backtrack right so currently you are a a consultant um and you work on executive searches I do I do what is that so it's I guess like back in the day they would call them headhunters you know and it's where you know you're looking for executives to place in a position Um, I think the difference with the the company that I work for is that we work with nonprofit organizations. So we place people in high-level positions at nonprofit organizations. Um, Our clients are the nonprofit organizations, and then we find the candidates for those positions. Um, We believe the right person in the right place can change the world, and... um, we definitely try to make it, we really make it an even playing field. Um, As a black woman, as black women, (laughs) you and I know that it's not always an even playing field. So I actually work for an executive search firm that like really zeroes in on diversity, you know? And um, I think that's why I like the work that I do so much, probably because of the organization that I'm doing the work with. Listen, Dina really enjoys her job. (laughs) She does. Like she, when she texts me and tell me about how fulfilled she is about her job, I'm, I'm like, wow, that's like, like, it's possible to actually work for an organization and to really enjoy your work. And you let me know that that's possible. Yeah, I didn't know it. I, I didn't. I mean, I didn't know that that type of culture existed 
Like, I didn't know that there was a culture that existed where the company means what they say and they do what they say they're going to do. And the work that they're doing is really honest and authentic work. And, you know, you are, you're making a change somewhere along the line. You may not be at the top of the food chain, but like you're moving the train. Like I always say that like when new people are hired and they're trying to figure their way through it it's like no you are like you're you're moving the train so it's like um i think the fulfillment doesn't just come from the work i think it comes from the vision behind the work and kind of knowing the people who the vision originally belonged to and how they still carry that vision but then at the same time how they display their appreciation for the way you handle the vision. So I think it's like, I think that's what it comes with. And I always say like the company model is something that they should bottle up and sell to, not just the search model, but how like people always say that like when I speak to candidates and they're like, oh my God, every, every one of you are just so lovely because of course candidates go through multiple searches with us. So they work with different people. And candidates always say, like, I've just never encountered any one of you that I haven't had a positive experience with. Like, do you guys really like your job? And I think it's more of liking the vision more than just the job. I think we get so used to calling something a job that we don't really take honest ownership of it if it's just a job. Wow. Kind of not really sure where to go from there, but no, no, let me stop. No. <laughs> All right, look. So you've worked um, on some really big searches: um, mm-hmm. Southern Poverty Law Center search, Innocence Project, People for American Way, the Sentencing Project. Tell us what that's like to place a high-level executive in that position, um, and like all of the 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 work behind making sure that nonprofits have a, um, a leader that is going to um, carry out what their mission is. Definitely. So I would say um, probably out of the searches I've worked on, I would say the Southern Poverty Law Center was probably the biggest search required the most work. And um, with those kind of searches, like everything is so confidential from the candidates, like it's strictly confidential. Um, A lot of work goes into it. The one thing that I love about what Koya does is before we even place the position on our site, we go out and we do needs assessment. This was pre-COVID, so of course everything's virtual now. But when I worked on Southern Poverty Law Center, this was pre-COVID. So they have, I believe it's 11 different sites. And um, there was a team of maybe like seven to eight of us. Normally there's a team of three to four. But this was such a big search that the team was double the size. But we went and we visited every single site. We go and we talk to everybody. Like if people want to talk, we're talking about from the receptionist to the CFO, it doesn't matter because what we want to hear is what do you want in a leader? We believe that everybody has a say in that, you know, and we believe it's really important to get buy-in from the people who are on the ground doing the work. So like um, a couple of places I went to was like Lumpkin, Georgia, which was like, like, whoa, okay. And (laughs) you have people out there that are doing this work like the ice detention center is less than a half a mile from the office and they're going there at 2 a.m and they're getting people out and you know it's really on the ground work and you're talking to these people and you're asking them what do you want to see in a president and ceo and they are telling you very heartfelt stories and we are documenting all of this And we take all of that into consideration when we build the position profile. We take all of that into consideration when we are talking to people about this position. Like, you go into these organizations and everything isn't pretty. Like, nothing's just like, oh, we've been so great here. Like, if we could just have another person that's like so-and-so, we'd be fine. No, 
most of the time you're looking for a different type of leader. So um, a lot of the candidates that apply, these are people that I've heard of before. I've seen their work, you know, and like who wouldn't want that job? And this is an organization since its existence, it's been ran by white men. Mm. And I worked with a company, I worked on a team that placed an Asian woman to run this company, you know? And to me, that was like, I pro that was probably the biggest highlight of my career. Wow. Because like that in itself is just like, that whole face, it just changes everything. It changes how the organization will approach things. It's just a completely different ball game. So I would say that that is definitely a highlight. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And um, it's a lot of confidentiality, but I think there's also a lot of, like you learn a lot as you go through it, you, you get to know the candidates and then you're kind of almost invested in it. And you're like, dang, I wanna see this person get it, but this person's also great too. So like at the end of the day with the finalists, I think I was going to be happy with whoever got the role, but the fact that it was actually a woman like me, if she considers herself a woman of color, that was just like probably the cherry on top. Nice, nice. So how did you get to Koya? So I got to Koya a really, like I tell most people this story at Koya. Um, I was working for a company called Upwork, which is, I think, I think they are the world's largest freelancing platform. Mm -hmm. So back in 2011, um, I got laid off with part of the Georgia State budget cuts when I was working at Georgia State University. So I was actually looking for work, but not really sure I wanted to go outside of the home because I had a daughter entering middle school and it kind of seemed like this was the time to be home. And um, I found a freelancing site. At that time, it was called Odesk and I created a profile. And I think within a week, I had like two, three different contracts and I started working and I was like, really? People are making money like legit like this. And I was doing all kind of admin work, customer support work, data entry. And I was on the site for quite a few years, maybe like four years. And then they switched. Um, someone bought them. They changed the name to Upwork. They had a merge. And the company Upwork reached out to me to be a project success manager, which deals with their enterprise clients and finding them qualified freelancers. So of course I was like, oh yeah, definitely. I started doing that, but I never got rid of my freelancing profile. And um, like, I, I really like the job, but to be honest in that job, there was really no way to advance. Mm -hmm. if you did not want to move to San Francisco or Chicago mm -hmm. and be in one of the corporate offices. So I knew it was kind of like, this is either it or like you do something else. Um, 2016, my daughter left for college. I had horrible empty nest syndrome. It was horrible. And um, so I was like, oh my God, life has no payday. What am I here for? Like the whole thing, I, I went through that, right? So I started journaling and I was just really searching for like, I needed something that was going to provide, like fulfill me. Like I'm an Aquarius, so naturally I'm a humanitarian. So what I do, it needs to benefit others and I need to know that and I need to feel it, you know? And what I was doing at Upwork is benefiting others, but it's not like benefiting people that are in need. Like I'm just going to a job, a bit miserable, to be honest. So um, I started journaling and I was looking for like, you know, what is my next place? And I was coming up with all of these ideas. Oh, maybe I should start a blog where it's a safe space for, you know, mothers to come and vent what they're going through. Like I had so many wonderful ideas. And then um, I got a message on Upwork maybe like two weeks later when I had decided. I said, you know, I'm going to be like 
just continue to do the job that I have. I'm going to be still, kind of look for the sign. Just let the universe move me in the direction that it thinks I should go in. And I think it was less than two weeks later, I got a message and um, it was from someone at Koya and they were like, hey, we have a contract position that we want to interview you for. So I interviewed for it and they told me they needed me 20 hours a week. I knew I couldn't leave my full-time job and just mm -hmm. work this 20 hours a week. But when I looked at the website, number one, it was a, a woman started the company 15 years ago. I mean, the company was 98% women. And I mean, they were kicking ass. Like in this executive search world, I'm reading bios and I'm like, really? And they're, they're, all of this is being done for nonprofit organizations. And I'm like, this is like, this seems like this is fulfilling work. So I'm like, I think it's worth working the full-time job and also working the 20 hours, which puts me at 60. So I spoke to the people at Upwork like, hey, I need to split up my shift. I need to work 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. And then I'll come back at 2 and I'll do 2 to 6. And so for Koya, I started working 11 to 2. And I probably did that maybe, it was from January to maybe like September. And then they made me an offer. It was such a no-brainer. I was like, oh, I'm out of here. They told me we discussed one figure. They came in at almost like eight, 9,000 higher than that figure. I was like, oh, I'm gone. And when I went to... Um, <laughs> I gave my two weeks notice because that's the professional thing to do. Don't burn your bridges. Um, but I was out like, because I knew it was from the contract work. It was giving me fulfillment. I'm working on these searches and mainly the searches I work on are like social justice searches and juvenile advocacy searches, which are all like, I'm passionate about, I'm passionate about both of those things. So just from doing the contract work, I'm like, this is something like I would have never thought of doing in my wildest dreams. Like, mm -hmm. it's just like, I didn't look at that career field. And um, when I went to get onboarded, it was just like, it was almost too perfect to be true that, you know, a lot of times we're all almost waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, why am I so worthy of this? Like, it's this yeah. horrible syndrome that we develop. And um, I was kind of like in that stage. And then I'm like, nah, this is just it. Like you've done the work, you know, and doing the work doesn't always look like, oh, I went to college and oh, I did this internship and oh, I did this. No, I just showed up as my authentic self every day for every position that I've accepted for, from someone. You know, I've just been an honest person. You know, and people know that if I say that I'm going to do something and I can do it, I'm a good team player, you know, and I think it's important for people to know that there are skills that you don't get from college that will take you a long way in the career field. You know, on my job, like people say stuff to me about me and I'm like, oh, that's me. That's what you got. Really? Okay. Look at her. Like, but it's just like. <laughs> But it's, it's like, okay, like, sometimes I battle with, because probably like 99.7% of the people at my job have a minimum of a bachelor's. And most of them have like master's, some have PhDs. They just like, you know, they have these amazing accolades and eight page, eight paragraph bios. And, and sometimes I'm kind of like, uh, like taken back by that. But then these are the same people that are telling me, like, there's nobody here who can do your job. Like, <laughs> I can't, you know what I mean? So I think um, sometimes in the workplace, especially when you work in a place where it's, where most people there have degrees, you kind of walk with this shame mm -hmm. for a minute into you, and then you like, I know for me, you over apologize for mistakes where everybody makes them. You know what I mean? You find yourself, oh, my apologies. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm, you know what I mean? You find yourself just overextending yourself. You're overworking yourself because since I don't have this piece of paper, now I'm going to show people that I'm actually worthy instead of just knowing like you got the job. You were worthy because they gave you the job, you know? So that's something that I've gotten past. I think it comes with, you know, self-reflection and doing work, you know, to get past that. But I think it's also a crutch that will hold a lot of 
specifically people of color, I don't see a lot of white people that deal with that. I don't see a lot of white people, like this girl on my job said something one day and I was like, and I was like, oh, um, I had recently started working there. And I was like, do they, um, do people normally do this like this, just asking her? And she was like, oh, I don't know. She was like, I'd rather ask for um, forgiveness than permission. And I was like, ooh, I'd rather ask for permission than forgiveness. Instantly, <laughs> I thought like, ooh, I'm the other way. But she, had, she, she said it with so much confidence, like, yeah, it's too much work here. Like, I got to keep it moving. You know what I mean? So I'd rather ask for forgiveness and permission. And when she said that, from that day forward, I was like, mm. she was like, yeah, own it. She was like, the work is yours, own it. I was like, you are absolutely right. And that was like an empowering, empowering moment. But I was like, why is that not already instilled in me? Mm. I don't, why do I not come into the workplace with that type of confidence? Wow. You know? I love that. So we need, so, I mean, I, you said a lot there. And what I heard was that you're consistent. You do what you say you're going to do. You're a team player. And you own it. Yeah. Now I do. Now, now you own it, right? Yeah. And, and you self-reflect. Definitely. Definitely. Now, is it because you don't have a degree is why you say that you um, have a non-traditional career? I say that because I say non-traditional because from where I ended up at, it doesn't go with where I started and what was in the middle. Like it just does like, I don't come from like what I did on Upwork, I guess you can consider that a tidbit of a recruiting but like people I work with, they come from recruiting backgrounds. You know, they've worked in HR departments where they've done heavy recruiting. I just never like, in my wildest dreams, if somebody said, give me your top 100 career choices, this would not be on the list. I wouldn't know that it exists like that. Like I heard of headhunters when I was younger. I know of staffing agencies. I know of temp agencies. But I don't really like I, I don't know of executive recruiting agencies and I didn't know that there's like executive search firms that strictly focus on placing people in high level positions at nonprofit organizations. Like when I got that um, when I got that job, uh, one of your previous guests, Tremaine Maxey, who I completely respect, he knows a lot about the nonprofit world, yeah. like really, you know. So um, when I got that job, I called him because I wanted to kind of tell him like, yo, look how my career path is changing. And so when I told him the company, he was like, oh, I know who they are. Their name rings bells. He was like, anybody in a nonprofit world knows them. And I was like, really? So when he said that, it was kind of like he sealed it for me. I was like, oh, I didn't know that, you know, but he knew that he knew that they had been out there doing good work. You know what I mean? So, um, I mean, since I've worked there, there are so many Black women that have been placed in high-level positions at various organizations, and not just Black women, like women, period. Probably more than half of the searches I've worked on, the placement has been a woman. Wow. You know what I mean? So to me, that really, it changes the trajectory of a big organization when a woman is at the top. It changes how that workspace is set up for other women. It changes yeah. how safe women feel in that workspace. Yeah. You know, so I think to me, that is, I guess that's like my motivation. And that's like, that's what makes me say like, oh no, I love my job. Like some days are definitely hard because it's a lot of work to do. But then it's like the end result is always so rewarding that it's like, okay, I, I can do this because I know the impact it's going to have. Through all of this COVID stuff, I've probably seen five from five candidates to clients that I've literally worked with. I saw one of my clients speak on Capitol Hill right after George Floyd's brother. You know what I mean? That's happened to be looking. I'm like, oh my God, look at Vanita. And it's like, yeah, because these people are out there changing the world, you know? So it's, it, it's really fulfilling. I would say that it fulfilled the empty nest part of me. 
Okay, but this is good because I kind of wanted to get to um, how you said that, you know, your daughter um, was going into middle school and you decided that you needed to be in the home. So you've yeah. been working remotely and from home for, what, almost nine years now. Yeah. You know, like, year, ten. tell us what it's like to, to, to work from home for so long and is there any, like, bits of advice that you can give us about working remotely? Because I was going to ask you, you know, how has your job changed it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not much. <laughs> Not much. Still getting up, going to the same office. Okay. Same but I will say um, a lot of people ask about working from home, and I'll tell people this. Get you a laptop. Master Microsoft Office learn how to manage a calendar, find you some legit freelancing sites, which are like upwork.com. I think they have one called freelancer.com. You can be 16, 17, 18. You can get on there because if you get on there, sometimes there are jobs where they just want you to write reviews for certain things. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just, you can, it's not like, oh, let me get on here because I want to get me a nine to five. There are people on there that want you to, hey, you know, check out my website, write a review for it. Let me know how I can change it. They have different focus groups. Some people just want you to do a good gig for someone trying to break into like working from home is always web research. Mm. Someone may want you to go online and find the top 1,000 hospitals in the east, on the East Coast. I mean, you got the time. You know what I mean? You want to make the money, get you a laptop, get you some headphones, um, Microsoft Office, get it down pat. You can take courses online. I mean, those are like, you don't have to invest much. And I would tell you, as you build your skills up, the money that you make will increase. Like it doesn't require you to go take a major course. It doesn't require you. I always tell people if somebody wants you to pay to get a job from home, it's not the job for you. Mm -hmm. I've never had a work at home job where I had to give anybody any money. Okay. Work it. Like that's just not it. You have so many of those bull craps. You, you don't have to do that. So. So, I mean, I usually ask for advice, but you gave us advice. Um, okay. which is great because how many people, um, have lost their jobs or their job or their furloughed, you know, and are struggling to figure out like what my next step, step is, yeah. I mean, why not go take a look and see what Upwork has to have so, so that you can continue to work home and, you know, yep. protect yourself from the Rona. So look, definitely. And I will tell this to all professionals whether you're black, it doesn't matter. Create a profile on these executive search sites. Mm. Even if you are not actively in the market, get into the database. There are so many of us that are not in the database. I work on searches where we're looking for specific people and we have to hunt them down. Like, we have to make ourselves more accessible. You know what I mean? We really do. And wow. I just see how we don't make ourselves that accessible. Because I, I see it just by working on searches, doing research, trying to build a candidate pool. And I think it's just because just from other can just from candidates I've heard like, oh, you know, I don't really know if, you know, the search firms have my best interests in mind. I don't know if I'm just being thrown in a pool as a as a, as a filler. You know, so there's, you know, there's quite a bit of distrust, I guess, that goes on because I guess as African-American people, we don't always feel like we can trust the people on the other side. You know what I mean? Get your profile on there. If you are in the HR field, if you're in the finance field, get your profile on these executive search sites. Create a a video on LinkedIn, get certified in DEI. I don't care what field you in, get certified in DEI and up the ante for yourself. It's wow. a, 
it's, it, it's, I'm telling you, it's busting wide open. So I, that's another gem that I figured I was route for like the professionals out there that are well off into their career. Even if you're in your entry, the entry level DEI, you always want to tell somebody, oh, well, I have these skills and I also am certified in DEI. Everybody wants to know the best way to treat us now. So use it to our advantage. All right. Dina, is there anything you want to plug? Do you have a project? I wish I did. I don't have... Um, do you want us to follow you on the socials? Do you want us to connect? I do want people to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I definitely want people to connect with me on LinkedIn. I think I'm Dina Tyler on LinkedIn. Um, I don't know how to, uh, how people plug their LinkedIn, like Dina Tyler. Yeah, I'm Dina Tyler. I work at Koya. You probably, if you're connected with Ebony, you can probably find me through her. But definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. If you see me post a position, and even if it doesn't fit your skill set, but it fits your cousin's friend's friend, show her the position and get her to apply to it. And, you know, let's help me put the right people in the right place. You know what, Sister Cousin? We are going to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dina. I'm so glad that you were here. That was so much fun. So listen, some takeaways for me from that conversation was is that when you're when the organization that you work for aligns with your values, your work could be joyful. We deserve to have joy in the workplace. Dina showed me that you could actually be happy at work. Who knew? Professionals, get on those executive searches. We have the skills. And we deserve to be in those spaces. Don't make them come find you. And make sure you connect with her on LinkedIn. Just go ahead and connect with her. Do it. She's here for us. She's a part of our community. And she wants to help us. Three, young people, you can make money. You're already home working remote. So why not get paid for your talents? Go ahead, create a profile on those freelance workspaces. And get paid for your talents. Let's do it. All right. So listen. Saturday. Next Saturday. One week from today. It's my birthday. And you know what we got to do. We got to raise this money for our liberated problem solvers. So these videos average about 100 views every week. Not bad. Now if each one of us gave $26 for the project, that would be very helpful. So do it. The link's in the link tree. All right, listen, another thing, last piece of homework, you need to go ahead and you need to register to be a part of the family conference. Our friends over at Share Ed Talent is having a family conference. The theme is education and advocacy. You, you need to do this, okay? They have some amazing and brilliant presenters. And I'm so excited that we will be presenting on, you know, you already know what we're presenting on, liberated career choices. Full of information, full of resources, but you're only gonna get this if you go over and register. The link is in the link tree. Register for the conference for Sheer Ed Talent. All right, folks, not going to keep you long. The weather's nice. It's the end of the summer. Starting to get to fall. You know what we got to do. We got to save ourselves. Wear your mask. Physically distance. Wash your hands. All Black Lives Matter. Make sure you vote. All right, I'll see you next week. Bye. Hey, you Come on, everybody.